Hey, I'm Janet Neal, your host of Superb Woman Sundays at 7. Thanks so much for joining us this week. I'm very thrilled. My guest this week is Judith E. Glazer, and we'll get to Judith in just a second. But first of all, for those of you who are new and you don't know anything much about the Superb Woman, let me tell you why I'm doing this. Um, I started the Superb Woman about a year ago with the belief that, one, the world is a mess, two, that women can save the world because they are powerful beings, and three, that m a lot of women don't realize that they are powerful beings, that they either don't believe they have any power or they're giving their power away. And so the Superb Woman is all about helping women to understand that they do have power and to step into that power and put it back out there for the betterment of all of us. So these, this uh, show is started because I have been meeting such amazing Superb Women on my um, journey lately and their stories are remarkable and they are life-changing and they are inspirational and I am so inspired and motivated by them and I thought I, I their stories need to be told I need to help share those stories and so that's what the Superb Woman Sundays at 7 is all about sharing the stories of remarkable superb women and my definition of a superb woman is a woman who is comfortable in her own skin who has taken the time to understand what's important to her, who has stepped back and looked at her, her values, you know, her strengths, her gifts, what it is that brings her joy, and has crafted and is living a life that uses all of that. So, no surprise, I have another superb woman here tonight. So, Judith E. Glazer is CEO of Benchmark Communications and the chairman of Creating We Institute. And she is a change agent, she is an executive coach, she's a person who works with uh, CEOs in major corporations, and she refers to herself as an organizational anthropologist. And a couple of her books, she's written seven, and one of them is We-Centric Leadership, there's one called Neuro Innovation, and her, I think it's her most recent one, is Conversational Intelligence. We'll be hearing all about that and even more. So welcome, Judith. I'm thrilled to be on your program tonight, Janet. So thrilled. This is so exciting for me. Oh, thanks. You know, I always tell people how we met because I think it's important um, for women to know how to meet other women. So Judith and I um, have mutual friends and met each other at a networking event um, where I've met a lot of other amazing, superb women. And actually, we'll be going to another networking event again tomorrow. Right. So, you know, putting yourself out there, um, you can just meet some amazing women. So, Judith, um, let's start with what is an organizational anthropologist? What a great question to start with. <laughs> I, uh, I, I actually don't know how many of us uh, are on this planet. Uh, I had a couple people tell me that that's the next uh, big uh, occupation to go into, which is interesting since I've been at all my life and that's probably the most important thing about me is that I get these ideas early and no one, no one else is doing it and then I have to find a, the right way to make the right circle around me but I, when I was in school I had a teacher his name is Jake Gruber by the way my son is named after Jake so that's how important he was, he was. and he was an anthropologist um, I was studying interdisciplinary studies which means I took everything and as some people said oh you just couldn't decide what you wanted to do and I said no I want to look at the intersections of all these amazing things like what does art have to do with science what does science have to do with anthropology or linguistics or I wanted them to all come together and see if there was some interconnections which clearly is what this field is all about and it's what's driven me for the last 30 years through all the books I've written and through all the work I've done is to see that human beings are what hold this all together. The heart and soul of a human being has pieces that help us understand all of those disciplines and when we bring them together the story of humanity changes and that's what I was looking for was how to, how to create that big story. So an organizational anthropologist is trained to observe what's in front of her and to observe in detail in ways that most people don't see because we go into our heads so quickly. My professor, for example, who I fell in love with, Dorian Stegg, she had two PhDs, psychology and philosophy. She would make me observe things and write down what I saw and then she would critique it. 
And to, where she would critique it is if I made interpretations or assumptions or judgments about what I was seeing. She let me know that because most of us talk and don't realize that we're doing that, right? We just we assume this is just the way the world is. Does that make sense so far? Oh, yes. And I'm thinking everyone needs that kind of training. I well, mean, how many times are, do people make assumptions and they don't really pay attention to what another person is saying? They say, exa exactly. And so actually part of that philosophy, that thinking, I've created models in conversational intelligence, which is my new book. And it's the book that has gone around the world and has gotten so much attention. It was, I know we're going to talk a little bit about this, but it was rejected over a hundred times, Janet. That's how many times I tried to get this book out into the world. And people kept saying, how, who would read a book that has medicine, science, leadership, uh, culture, you're putting too many things together and you know what leader is going to use it. Well now I have to tell you that the book has gone into multiple printings in the first couple months. So I guess now is the time when, I mean you, Obama put four billion dollars into research on neuroscience. So it, it try, I think it began to make this a legitimate part of everyday life, not something that just scientists you know would be interested in. So Wow, so, so you really are, you have found a way to to um, combine science and art. It's, it's really um, taking a look at the human condition but from the scientific um, discipline. Yep, exactly. And what I found, and this is the most exciting research I've ever done in my life, and I, I am a scientist at heart, so I, you know, I have many degrees, I've studied a lot in, in school, but what I, dis what I found is that if we go down into how when we're co communicating with people, what's happening in our brain, and literally realize that the shape of the conversational space has an impact on what happens in our brain and what chemistry we activate. So I talk a lot about ke chemicals and co chemical cocktails. In other words, if I'm talking to you and you're a boss and you really aren't happy with my work, you, know, you try not to say it, but you show it in your body in different ways, just the body before you speak. My body is picking up that chemistry immediately, that judgment. So the difference between appreciating someone and judging someone is about a big, as big as you can get. It's bigger than you know the, the it's a, bigger than a mile because we we feel the differences so much. Human beings are ultra sensitive. You know that, right? You study right. so many things. You study this in people. And what I wanted to do is is bring it down to at the moment of contact when we're communicating with someone, we're activating a cocktail, and that cocktail is either going to open open us up or close us down. And as we begin to see what shapes that opening up or closing down, human beings become so smart and hu human with each other. They're not just in their head with ideas, but mm -hmm. now they're observing, which is what my professor, that gift that she gave me of six months just in that part of the work that we did, being critiqued in, sh in observing what I was missing. And all of a sudden, the world looked different to me. Wow. So how do you work with um, executives in companies to help them to open up and, and to see things differently, see their behavior differently? I'll, I'll give you a story of one guy who, uh, he's one of my favorites because when it happened to him that he, he said to me, you know, what did, actually his, he, he, was, he was a best practice leader in Verizon, so I'm a Verizon user, so I feel very good that I, <laughs> he came from Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually um, interviewed 13 coaches before he picked one. And he picked me, he said, because I didn't make him wrong. In other words, all the other coaches said, I'll work with you on your problem. And I never, like the word problem, I never mentioned the problem. I said, I don't know whether that research, what it means. Um, I was trained to question everything. So we worked for about six weeks, and he was a best practice leader. He pushed people. He gave them literature to go home and read on the weekend so they could all be great leaders with him. He, when they wrote papers for the CEO, he would critique them so that they'd be the best. He was trying to teach them how to be the best, right? In the meantime, he sent people into the hospital. The, wow. pres the pressure of, in his mind, he was best practice leader. In reality, what he was doing was causing, he caused one guy to have a heart attack who he almost gave up his pension of 25 years because he couldn't work with this guy anymore. And that was what obviously brought coaches into the picture. But anyway, finally, when I got him to experiment, and I said experiment with just one thing, because he was really pretty adamant for a long time. I said, do me a favor. Instead of when you go to meetings and you tell your people what the agenda is, when you go away on vacation or when you go away, you actually tell them what you want to talk about at the next meeting. I said, I get a sense from interviewing people that you don't ask them a lot of questions. You don't pull 
you're teaching, you're bringing value, you're giving all these wonderful things to them, but you need interactions are about going back and forth with people, like the rhythm of an interaction is I want to give you and then I want to receive from you. If you're not giving and receiving, then you're not activating humanity in people. I said, so just do this for me. Just try to pull their ideas. And he did it. The very next day, I got a call from these people who were so frightened of him. And there were the, both, both, there were four people actually said, in some form or another, what did you give my boss to drink? <laughs> <laughs> That's the chemical. That's when I first said, oh my God, just that shift in those two dynamics, the relationship between asking and telling. And so that was where it became clear for me that if I study interaction dynamics, that I will be able to all of a sudden understand how people can shift energy. And you don't have to remold a person. My coaching is not about spending a lot of time in people's heads. I've listened to some coaches that from Harvard that are extraordinary and they talk about all the questions they ask and everything. I, I actually have, I'm a minimalist. I want to understand the dynamic. And when that happens, then everything opens up. Wow. So. I love that phrase, activating humanity. Mm. That, that's really says it all. Interestingly enough, Janet, I love that you love that, first of all. Um, and what I've learned is that there's a part of the brain and, and part of our body where that humanity resides. Hmm. Right? Or, okay, so it's, it's, it's not every place. In other words, it would be great to say every human being has the potential to live their richest and fullest humanity. They will if we learn how to make the connection stronger between our heart and our prefrontal cortex, which is the most advanced part of our brain. And there are ways to teach people that. There are rituals that people do to bring that, that part of the brain, this heart and prefrontal cortex, into greater connection. When that energetic flow is coming from heart and prefrontal and we trust people, then everything opens up in our body. It's as though that's the place where the buttons are. And if we've turned on the right buttons and we, we calibrate with a person, we get in sync with them and we both feel, oh my God, I can trust you, I can feel it, I can open up my heart, I can open up my mind, the mind and the heart actually open up. It's what, it's, it's what philosophers have been saying for thousands of years, but now we know it's exactly what's happening. Okay, so I, you are definitely um, showing <laughs> your work because I'm getting goosebumps when you're talking, it's very exciting. It's very, oh. I really get what you're talking about and it, it's, it's really exciting work. But I. I want to hear how, you know, I don't think you said you've always been interested in a lot of different things, um, but you were telling me before we went live this incredible story about how you weren't always this connected and able to give goosebumps to people the way you do it now. Yeah. Um, share that story with our, our viewers, please. Yeah. Actually, I'm getting chills when I think about sharing it. So, um, let me see where I want to get into the story. Where, where I wanted to get into the story, I guess, is that, like all of us, sometimes we end up growing into our ego self. We grow into the person that we think either we need to be because this will make everybody happy in our family, it will make our parents happy, it will satisfy some criteria in our social network. I mean, that happens to all of us. It's kind of the imposter syndrome a little bit because you kind of know that you're that's not where you want to be and it doesn't feel good inside. but it's, it's where you're headed and you get the kudos in whatever way you think are important. I hit that place. I hit it in, in 2001 and I hit it within the same week and on the same time and I'll share with you exactly what it is uh, that the World Trade Center was being attacked is when that insight smacked me over the head and heart and every part of my body um, because that was the year that I was, it was my first seven figure year ever in, the, in my business and I was flying like a kite that I could do that. I had the most incredible clients anybody could want, but I wasn't integrated. My heart and my mind were integrated and I could feel it happening to me and I couldn't share what I was going through because then I'd reveal that I was a human being to people. Mm. So I didn't turn to friends, I didn't turn to my husband, I didn't, even when I had a drink of wine, I couldn't get there. And, and share those things. Um, I wasn't vulnerable and I, anyway, so on September 11th, 2001, at the same time that the World Trade Center was being attacked, I walked out of the elevator on the 19th floor of the hospital that I went to, to go in to meet the doctor to find out um, what was going on in my body. 
because I had gotten uh, a special test, a biopsy. I found the lump. It was not through a mammogram, and I was going to find out if I had cancer exactly at the same time that the World Trade Center was being attacked. And I walked out of the elevator. A woman was on the phone, turned to me and said, the second, pl no, the, a plane hit the World Trade Center. What happened? Terrorists? What happened? That's how I found, at like 10 of 9. Wow. And, then I went, and then I went in the doctor's office and I sat and I was the next patient. And I went in now knowing that this was going on. The doctor told me that this was happening. But my reports were coming through a fax and they were coming one page at a time. So she'd read what the, the biopsy report was for me at the same time that this was happening in the world. Um, three pages came in. 15 minutes apart because they had trouble with the facts. And the first one said, yes, you have breast cancer, but um, we don't think you're going to need radiation. That's what she, the doctor interpreted from the sheet. Um, she said, so just hang in, but I need to get the others to confirm all the details. Page two said that I had breast cancer and it was going to require radiation because they picked up that the chemistry of this particular uh, cancer I had was very, very virulent. And by the third page, um, they did some other tests and they found out that I had um, cancer in my bone as well, which meant it had spread in some form in my body. Even though it was small, it was what they call aggressive cancer. And so by that point, I had to go through, I was told I had to go through radiation and chemo. And so um, I, I freaked out. I mean, I said I have to call my husband and I called him and I said, I just want you to know I have breast cancer. And he said, I love you, come home. And at that time, you know, what was going on in the world. People were leaving New York, right? And I had to get from 92nd Street down to um, 60th and um, 59th. And as I walked down Madison Avenue, blackout curtains dropped one after the other after the other as people were exiting all of the stores on Madison Avenue. And I got to uh, FAO Schwartz where there were big TVs and there were people holding each other and crying. And that was the first time I got to see what happened at the World Trade Center. It was the second plane that hit and I, I cannot believe that the same, I still get chills thinking about it, the same day, that day was my diagnosis and I spent the week in New York City because nobody could get home easily and I was operated on the, the very next week. So, Wow, that, that's an amazing story and so grateful that you're here and you're okay now. I'm I'm so happy. Um, the sad part, and I wrote a mem I wrote a um, a story about this. I hope someday it'll get become a film because I grew up in a family that uh, where my mother had cancer. She had it for 11 years. She got diagnosed when I was 11, and from that point on, it was a uh, melanoma on her leg. My father didn't want to take it off because he didn't want us to be in Mexico with my mother with crutches because they were they were helping set oh, up. A no. This is part of the story. Um, and so she kept she kept it, and uh, her legs rubbed, and it spread throughout her body that summer. Um, oh, no. And you don't want to hear all the details, but she had been she went through every possible um, treatment. My dad went around the world finding things to give her that were atypical because chemo wasn't working either. So for 11 years, you know, we we lived through this, and she passed away a month after I got married. We had to cancel my wedding and do a little chapel wedding. So I lived through all of that, right? And I and it's all about this is what I want to switch. It's all about connectivity, because I I mean cancer is about connection, cells connecting or unhealthy cells not connecting, right? Mm -hmm. And when I realized that I was living through, my mother pulled away. She retreated for eleven years. Um, so we didn't have what that 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 lifeblood conversation that we need to stay in a healthy place. And so um, that's became the thrust that moved my work from conversations to conversational intelligence because I want to understand more about the intelligence behind it. What What is it that changes people's whole life through the conversational space? That became my work. Wow. So, and you said that, that that, you know, getting cancer was something that was really a turning point for you. That's when you really started getting that mind-body connection in, in your own life. Yep. I realized that what I had done during that time even though I was in the in, in a different place from a financial standpoint, what I had done is connected myself, disconnected myself from people who I needed to understand me and for me to understand them, people who could support me and care for me. I had disconnected terribly and I was in my own ego place. And as soon as that was over, I realized, because I saw what happened to my mother, I realized this is it. This is what I have to grab onto in my own life. Yeah. And I started to write emails and reach out to and talk to people when I was going through the chemo. And everybody I wrote to, it was like they were so grateful that I shared 
because they knew I was not a sharer, right? And mm -hmm. this was mm -hmm. the first time I had personally opened up to people. And the change in my life, the I had my, one of my best friends who I've known from when I was 16, when I had to make the decision to take the, the strongest chemo, they give you a choice. And the strongest chemo means you lose your hair. And I said, Susan, what do I do? And she said, she put it in perspective, she said, you know what? It's not a big deal. She said, you get wigs, you get great wigs, you get wonderful wigs. She said, Worry about she said, put your money on, put your thoughts on shoes. You're going to go out and buy the most gorgeous shoes you can find because your feet need to touch the ground, your soul needs to touch the ground, that's important. And yeah. you're going to have lovely wigs. And I went out and I bought four different wigs. I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer after that, you know. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. great. So, yeah. so you had this absolute turning point in your life. Um, so I always like to say that that you know we can't do these things by ourselves. So who are some of the kind of, who are some of the people who have helped you on your path that have kind of brought you to where you are today? Besides your wonderful friend who helped you with that great perspective. My wonderful friends, and interestingly enough, my husband. Um, I had I met my husband. We had three dates and got married. Now that's oh. <laughs> we had three dates and got married. Seriously, if I could count the hours that I spent with him before we got married, and one of the things I just knew this would come to bear, but I didn't. I could. We've been married 45 years. Okay, so that's a long time. My wow. husband. My husband's background is medicinal chemistry and biochemistry, and the day that I was diagnosed, he got asked to be the president and CEO of an early stage cancer company. God put us together. It was just coincidental that day and you were diagnosed. I was diagnosed and within within five days after I got diagnosed, when I was going in for my operation, he was asked to become the CEO of a company. Wow. Right. Right, exactly. So I have to, I think that the angels put us together. Mm. Yeah, I, got, I, I was I was given a quick screening process. <laughs> wow. And, and now, wait a minute, now he's the president of the company that I created. Oh wow, that's great! Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I would say when you ask me people that have impacted my life, it's um, I think my husband because he came from such a healthy family and he taught me so much. I mean, he taught my me and my kids how to make up when you've had a bad fight and all the things that were the rituals that his family did. So he's number one on my hit list of of uh, impact. I have to say, my children are astounding and. The love and the the caring that they give the as they're raising their children, I see the difference in what I grew up in. So I get to see these angels bringing angels into the world again. I mean, it's just uh -huh. phenomenal. So they bring tears to my eyes. Um, I'll tell you somebody who, because she's a woman, I have to share a cup uh, two stories. One is that um, I I got a chance to work with Donna Karen. I was her consultant for two years. So fashion business, you know, the whole right. thing. It's um it's a it's close to my heart because I used to make my own clothes so this I finally got to work with someone that actually did it and was successful doing it I just did it because I love to do it <laughs> um, but in in amongst her her presidents that I got to work with all eleven of them was Angela Arnst Angela Arnst I met when she was pregnant with her first child twenty years ago uh, she headed up Women Couture so it's the high end of fashion mm -hmm. we started to work together she's the one that changed my name from Judy to Judith. Oh, said, interesting. Yes, she said. She said, "You are a Judith, not a Judy." And she said, "You know, maybe as a couture designer and and president, um, and that kind of influenced it." So she changed my name. But anyway, I I got a chance to work with her over twenty years, and Angela Arntz became the CEO of Burberry about seven years ago. I don't know if you know that, but she I didn't know that. And she turned the company around. It was a um, much more traditional hundred-year-old raincoat company. And she did the transformation that turned Burberry into the fourth fastest growing company in the planet. Wow. After, after Google, Apple, and what was the other one? Amazon. That's very impressive for a, um, a fashion company to, to grow that quickly. Exactly. It's very, very unusual. Very unusual. She w took the company from $1 billion to $3 billion in about four or five years. Unheard of. I mean, truly, right. she right. she became a dame in, in in the UK. But anyway, uh, in March of this past year, she was hired away by Apple. Ah, uh -huh. interesting. Yeah, and 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 I'm saying this publicly. I bet you, I'm betting that she's going to become the CEO of Apple at some point. How interesting! Yeah. Wow. So obviously, you did a good job coaching. 
Well, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I have to say, she had all the goods. I mean, it, what's amazing is that, um, and I believed in her, and, and, and I worked with her through some of her challenges, but, but she, she was raised in an amazing family. So I, I learned so much from her about how to create a healthy relationship in your growing up and about how to do it in your company. And mm -hmm. my book has a lot about trust, so I have a whole chapter on, on her in my book about how, what she did to help shape Burberry to be able to be that kind of a transformational company. And a lot has to do with how you build trust in an organization. Mm -hmm. So she was my, she's my next great, what would I say, godlike figure <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so we're winding down here, um, but I wanted to um, ask you um, two questions. First one is, I always say that uh, another trait that a superb woman has is that they um, they live a or strive to live a should-free life. So, what's one should that you have released in your life? Well, I, this has been well, this is where my childhood um, experiences came in. From the time I was little, I bucked the system. I didn't believe in status quo. I used to run away from home, so I shouldn't be told what to do. Is my number one. Do not tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell me, I will probably do the opposite. Right. Uh -huh. So. When I was told not to smoke, that's when I smoked. When I was told that I could stop smoking is when I, or when I could start smoking is when I stopped smoking. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. So, so should is kind of um, an interesting thing for you. It doesn't work. <laughs> right, right. <coughs> Although I did hear for, from you that, um, sim very similar to my story, that you listened to everybody else. Um, and as far as what you should do with your life, even though you said you would do the opposite, but but I heard a lot in there about um, you know living your life according to you know society and and when they said uh, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't study all these different things, um, but I, I, I am I mistaking something here? But I I really thought that I heard something in there about you listening to everybody else around you at some point in your life. It, it was at the point when I was doing so well in business and I started to live into the ideal yes. of what a person should be. That's the one, yeah. you, you know, you should, whatever. And right. I don't even remember, I just remember realizing that it was like it came from behind me in the unconscious mm -hmm. that I was being a certain kind of person. And I'm a hippie at heart. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I made my own clothes. You know, there are a lot of things that I did that were, and I wasn't releasing that part of me that was the human part. Uh, I, I was the perfect part when it came to at that point in my life, right? right. And I don't think that that's a very healthy place to be. You yeah. Know, I stopped turning to people for help. I stopped asking my friends. I stopped sharing when I was un insecure about a decision. I didn't share that because, quote, I was supposed to have it all. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And I mean, that that's another one of my um, my strong feelings is is that we need to let go of the superwoman. Um, role that a superwoman is somebody who feels like she has to do everything, do it by herself and do it perfectly, which yeah. absolutely serves no one and only results in burnout and frustration and um, replace it instead with a superb woman, which Judith, you have done a very good job. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank very you. nice. So lastly, what's next for you? What's on the well, horizon for you? So, so my book, Conversational Intelligence, which I hope it has some of these stories about how to create breakthroughs in using conversations. I hope that that um, it continues to do well because it's now going around the world. We set up last week. We set up um, creating We Institute in Mexico. We are now going to set one up in Australia, in China, in the UK, in Brussels, uh, Germany. I mean, I, I'm beside myself, which means that this work is going to go global, really. And um, in the spirit of, I know that, that my parents are not alive. My father was a dentist who brought dentistry around the world as an ambassador. And so I am now, I guess, fulfilling that spirit in my own way. And I hope that in some way um, this work will have as much meaning to people around the world as it did for us and our family as we began to discover our own humanity through a conversational intelligence. So that's my next big plan. Oh, well, I wish you all the best, and I know you'll be very successful with it. And boy, the world sure needs oh. conversations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, 
Yeah, I love you. I love your questions. Um, I love being on your show, and I really appreciate the time for us to. I don't share the story that I shared with you that often, so you did well, a good job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you, Judith, for being my guest. You're welcome. Next week, um, please join me where it's going to be a live on location um, show. I'm going to be at Women at Woodstock, a fabulous retreat for women over 50. If you are over 50 and not doing anything next week and you want to come out to Palm Springs, California, go to womenatwoodstock.com and find out all about this fabulous retreat. And I will be interviewing Ann Baker live at Women at Woodstock next week. And is the founder and um, creator of the retreats. So stay tuned for that one. That should be a fun one as well. So have a fabulous week, and I look forward to seeing you next week on Superb Women Sundays at 7. Thanks.